are going. We've had a reduction in staff members in New Zealand, and we've lost some great people and gained some great new faces too. We also have some new fundraising programs, which will be covered by Tim Kay and Alexander Hillary later in the hour. The Himalayan Trust now only operates through one NGO partner in Nepal. That's Himalayan Trust Nepal under the leadership of Mingma Norbu. We are back with the Kathmandu-based team where the Himalayan Trust started. And this feels both right and most efficient and reliable. I want to streamline our operations, simplify our processes, and concentrate on our primary role, which is fundraising here in New Zealand and supporting our education, health, and other programs in Nepal. I am deeply indebted to Mike Gill, who stepped down from the stresses of being chair of the Himalayan Trust, only to find he is doing just as much work supporting me as the deputy chair. So thank you, Mike. There is a strong Hillary presence on the board and amongst our staff. George Hillary is on the board and on the finance committee. And Alexander Hillary is our new New Zealand operations manager. The impacts of COVID-19 on our Nepal operations have been very substantial. We've had numerous video calls to Nepal, and it's been a great way of, of staying in touch with what's happening on the ground, not just in Kathmandu, but out in the field as uh, Mingma Norbu's team uh, head out there into Solu Kumbu to oversee the programs. It's also made us acutely aware of the terrible impact um, that our Himalayan Trust Nepal team has experienced themselves with this pandemic. Obviously, it has struck Nepal um, very badly. Uh, there was a delay in, in the disease and the infections moving up into the Solu Kumbu, but of course, eventually it arrived there. I guess to illustrate how terrible this disease is, many members of our Himalayan Trust Nepal partners have been impacted or had members of their households impacted. And I'm thinking here particularly of our accountant in Kathmandu, Bawin Tanduka, who has lost three members of his family, which is just absolutely heartbreaking, but again, brings it home what a terrible disease this is and how deeply it has affected Nepal and is, of course, um, affecting New Zealand right now. The pandemic reminds us of my father's response back in 1963 to a pandemic of smallpox and their swift response with vaccinating the Kumbu population. And I know that this is going to be talked about a bit, a bit further on. But that was one of the hallmarks of the Himalayan Trust. Small, quick to move, and good at adapting to new situations and, and dealing with what needs to be deal, dealt with. Back in 63, they uh, trained people up amongst dads, uh, building and mountaineering team to help the doctors go out and vaccinate the, pop, the local population. Looking ahead, we, our priorities are obviously fundraising. That's what this organization in New Zealand is really all about. We want to get back to visits to Nepal after two years of uh, not being able to leave the country and return to the Himalayas. And of course, ensuring that there is not a missed generation of students in Solo Kumbu due to the pandemic and all of the restrictions. This has been an issue not just in Nepal, but around the world. And this is something that we want to focus on over the next couple of years with our program. We have a special relationship with Nepal 
that comes from the teamwork of Hillary and Tenzing on Everest back in 1953. And this continues with the close cooperation between us with the work of the Himalayan Trust. Thank you for being such dedicated and long-term supporters. And now I'd like to introduce to you uh, our partner in Nepal, the Chief Executive Officer of the Himalayan Trust Nepal, Dr. Mingma Norbu, who is speaking to us from Kathmandu. Welcome, Mingma. Hi, Mengma, if you could please uh, turn on your microphone. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you very much for your uh, welcome remarks. And uh, so uh, I have the 10 minutes, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, thank you very much, uh, Himalayan Trust New Zealand, Peter, and your entire team for inviting me to represent Himalayan Trust Nepal. And uh, we are uh, really delighted uh, to be part of this uh, excellent and historical organization. And um, on behalf of the Himalayan Trust Nepal team uh, and the executive board, Chairman Pasundawa, as well as the uh, general body and executive board and staff family, I would once again like to acknowledge your uh, great, great support and uh, long-term partnership. And the I would also like to thank Himalayan Trust um, uh, the, uh, the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs and New Zealand government uh, for supporting uh, for supporting Himalayan Trust uh, Nepal uh, through Himalayan Trust New Zealand. And uh, we are really, really happy that the changes, any changes that uh, took place over the last five years has been uh, so great. And uh, so the, the trust is moving towards the right direction and we are trying to, we are reaching to the poorest of the poor and the most uh, vulnerable and also the target groups in the uh, rural mountains of Solokumbu and which Sir Ed would have, um, uh, uh, would be yeah. very happy. And uh, so thank you very much for your uh, wonderful cooperation. And now I would like to uh, make a short presentation of our achievement over the last year. Uh, particularly, I'm focusing on the uh, the support that Himalayan Trust New Zealand has provided to uh, uh, to only the single partner in Nepal, that is Himalayan Trust Nepal, over the last uh, fiscal year, 2020-21. Okay, so I think uh, I think um, Alex, can you change the uh, slide? Please? Mingma, are you able to take control of the presentation and the top of the uh, Microsoft yes. Teams? Window? Yeah, with the with the with the project screen, but it's not. Yeah. Uh, with the project project, say, with the project, say, with the project, say, with the uh, can you see now? Uh oh. Uh, I don't remember. Um, Mingma, I'm happy to um, push through the slides for you. Um, yeah, I think, I think you have to control from there. Uh, it's, uh, it's not working from here. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. So uh, yeah, this is a uh, um, this is the cover uh, the topics that I'm going to cover today in this discussion: uh, education program, health program, and livelihood program. Next, please. Uh, take control. Uh, take control. Yeah, listen. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, can you can you see it now? Absolutely. Thank yes. you. Alex, can you see it? Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, so this is the vision of the Sir Ed that um, he wants. He wanted to uh, develop uh, the mountain rural area of Solokombu through his several friends, and we are just continuing his vision, particularly. And uh, the area that uh, some of our, your uh, your member or our member may not be familiar with uh, the area, uh, and we are working in uh, Solokombu uh, district. And um, from last two years, we have expanded uh, a little project in Rolaling and also Okadunga through our partners that's uh, uh, Forgotten Sherpas Trust of New Zealand and uh, and also the Venus Shemot Foundation. Otherwise, uh, from the Himalayan Trust uh, New Zealand and also our partner donors uh, from America, uh, UK and other parts of the world, we are particularly focused in Solokumbu in terms of health, education and livelihood projects. And uh, as you uh, saw the, uh, the beginning slide, uh, you know, the last two years of, and uh, particularly the last year was very difficult and most challenging one. And we had to work differently and, uh, but with more uh, change working strategy. Uh, so therefore uh, we had to, uh, you know, from the, uh, in, from, for the education program to implement in the field, and it wasn't easy and all schools remained closed because of the COVID and lockdown and uh, few people were confused, everybody was confused. And so we had to take different strategy and then we tried to connect uh, all the teachers uh, who were supported by Himalayan Trust. And uh, so we conducted virtual meeting and tried to best utilize their time and resources because our donors were ask, asking what are the teachers doing at this pandemic time. So we try to connect them and make the best uh, utilization of their time and resources. And in, in within this education theme, uh, Computer Lab is another important project that we have been implementing over the last two, uh, three fiscal years. We have now set up to, uh, 20 computer labs uh, with the partnership between Himalayan Trust and uh, EduTech Nepal. It's a New Zealand based, crisis based uh, uh, education program. So, this program is also running very well. And uh, this year we set up five labs, and next year we are planning for another five. And part of the, part of the partnership fund came from Himalayan Trust New Zealand and EMFAT. And, uh, and scholarship is another important uh, project that we are implementing. And uh, we are implementing Sir Edmund Hillary Memorial Scholarship through the funding of Himalayan Trust New Zealand and uh, MPAT. And 48 students have been benefiting every year uh, under this for grade, studying grade 11 and 12. And, uh, and another category of scholarship is the partnership between uh, bachelor level scholarship, which uh, we operated in collaboration with the uh, Kumbu Pasang Lamo uh, Rural Municipality, and uh, we uh, deliver six. We awarded six scholarships last year, and likewise, uh, fifteen scholarships for the bachelor level studies from, through the Emirates New Zealand and Ministry of MFAT have been uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs and uh, Trades have been implemented over the last fiscal year. And uh, teacher support uh, in order to implement the English medium uh, education in the Kumbu Pasanglam Rural Municipality uh, in 16 schools were one of the major focuses of our program in quality education, and uh, which has been effective from 2012. And this uh, program has made a, a huge change in the quality of the education of Kumbu students. And those, um, in, you know, in the past, the uh, those who graduate high school from uh, Kumbu school would uh, would have to struggle with the English level uh, in Kathmandu based colleges or uh, secondary, uh, secondary level studies. Uh, now the students from Kumbu, they can uh, really cope with the level of the English standard in Kathmandu boarding schools. So they can, there's, a, there's always a possibility of uh, uh, advancing their studies in Kathmandu. And this is uh, one of the major uh, outcomes of this uh, education teacher support from the New Zealand. And another important uh, project is the teaching material support to 65 schools. Uh, this, you know, stationaries, books, and uh, office uh, running, operating uh, um, stationaries. These are really useful and helpful materials for the government's public schools and uh, which uh, which has been 
uh, running very effectively and helping the poorest of the poor and uh, those who can't afford um, the, for the stationaries. And school-based teachers training program, which uh, is another important project, and now we are running uh, uh, advanced phase of the uh, school-based uh, teachers training program, and we have, uh, you know, uh, last year wasn't easy, and uh, so we had to work differently. As I said before, the our teachers training team developed this kind of uh, the uh, student self-learning guidelines, uh, and then. Deli uh, do, they developed this during the lockdown and delivered to the field and oriented the teachers and students how to uh, involve their uh, children in the learning activities. Likewise, we could uh, conduct the baseline survey in the uh, school-based teacher training program um, implemented uh, schools. And Mahindra is here and he's assessing the learning uh, doing the basic uh, baseline survey of the uh, learning outcomes or the, you know, um, the standards of the students' uh, uh, learning. So uh, we have now produced the baseline survey report, and uh, this has been circulated to Himalayan Trust New Zealand, as well as Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trades. And another important uh, part of the project is support with the school furniture and the computer and uh, uh, printers and so forth and this is this this project comes from the uh, one of the activities under the quality education program under a small grant program mm -hmm. and uh, another now i'm going to talk a little bit about the health program and kunde and health fabdu uh, are our major hospitals um, and uh, so whatever activities we have delivered from kunde and uh, and the three out associated outreach clinics uh, are here. The present, the I have presented the data here. Uh, Kunde Hospital got received um, treated uh, 4,078 patients over the last fiscal year, and and the male and female populations are indicated here. And uh, likewise, uh, Monzu, Portse, and Pame Clinic treated uh, 1,640 patients and the male female data are presented here and also uh, because of the COVID uh, even the health workers had to be very careful and work differently and uh, and and this um, uh, you know the as the COVID uh, disease advanced uh, last year we had uh, this year we could train when they train uh, three of the community clinic uh, health workers to undertake uh, antigen test, so they uh, perfectly delivered the services from Kunde Hospital, and um, uh, we had the staff uh, changes in Kunde, and now Dr. Kami has uh, stepped down and uh, he's working as a part-time consultant. Uh, but Dr. Min uh, she uh, she's here uh, in the apron, so she's taking the uh, leadership of the Kunde Hospital. And this year is a kind of transition. Uh, well, last year and this year is kind of transition. <coughs> Uh, for Kunde and um, for doctor, uh, both of the staffs and uh, both of the doctors. So they are uh, managing the hospital uh, without any, uh, you know, uh, weaknesses or any problems. So they are doing the good job. And leadership, uh, so, okay, here. So the COVID, trend, uh, COVID screening test was another important, I said already. And uh, COVID, total COVID patients treated from Kunde is uh, May, they treated 46 and June 38, and total 84 patients were uh, treated from, from Kunde Hospital. But the Kunde Hospital itself did not uh, treat the patients by keeping the, uh, you know, them in the hospital. They uh, provided distance services to the, uh, to the patient's home. So uh, now, Namche now and Namche Dental Clinic is uh, one of the projects that Himalayan Trust is managing. But uh, from the Himalayan Trust New Zealand po point of view, uh, I wanted to just mention here because uh, uh, through Dr. Lindsay Strang and his friends, uh, uh, they sent uh, they sent uh, uh, small uh, some support, uh, which was good enough for buying the autoclave for the dental uh, clinic and also the sterilizer. Um, an endomotor and a sterilizer for the dental clinic. Uh, so thank you for that support. And health uh, 
under the health uh, COVID prevention metro support to uh, Pablo Hospital uh, through Himalayan Trust New Zealand has been very uh, useful and uh, and uh, you know Pablo Hospital treated altogether 12,243 uh, patients and out of them uh, here I have presented the COVID data 151 male and 150 uh, 121 female altogether 640 COVID patients were uh, treated from Pablo Hospital. The hospital admitted the patients there and they uh, provided the excellent service. Uh, likewise, uh, you can see from the photos, um, you know, the COVID, we had the first and second uh, phases of COVID uh, uh, lockdown and, uh, and also the support went on accordingly. Uh, so over the 2020-21, we could, uh, you know, deliver uh, COVID prevention materials and PPA sets, personal protective equipment to all the uh, clinics, health posts, and um, hospitals, and the government offices and local government institutions, so which could uh, uh, really manage the COVID in a better shape. And uh, likewise, uh, here are more photos. And uh, here you can see the second wave. Now this is uh, uh, the recent from you know from April 2021. Uh, this is the during the second uh, lockdown and we could uh, work very effectively and actively, and we could uh, mobilize all the uh, our donors and partners, uh, and uh, they really help us. And uh, apart from Himalayan Trust New Zealand, they, you know, we had a, a joint and um, consolidated uh, effort to, to manage and tackle with the COVID. And uh, co we also operated Komjung Isolation Center, which, uh, which um, uh, had a which had a doctor and as well as nurses, and uh, which tested 149 uh, patients, and uh, 29 patients were admitted in the isolation center and treated, and only one uh, person who was referred from Kun uh, isolation center to Kathmandu, uh, she was a, a 42 years old lady from Kunde, and she died uh, in Kathmandu, and apart from there uh, that there was no casualties no modality. And here you can see COVID second wave response, more uh, material distributions. And we could uh, we could reach each and every corner of the uh, people in Solukumbu district. And, uh, you know, in the first year uh, when the lockdown uh, started, there was uh, there were quite a few numbers of uh, non-profit organizations, uh, you know, they, they, they were fond of supporting the people and trying to uh, publicize themselves uh, and uh, but this year uh, uh, you know um, those NGOs non-profit organizations and charity didn't appear maybe they faced uh, challenging for raising further fund and only Himalayan Trust uh, was in the solo combo district which could demonstrate uh, real action on the field and when the lockdown second lockdown started and the real need uh, was there so uh, thank you very much for your uh, support, uh, Himalayan Trust New Zealand and uh, people of New Zealand. And one, the livelihood now, um, uh, the Monzu Community Water and Fire Hydrant Project is, project is one of our livelihood, uh, biggest uh, livelihood projects and which uh, had been possible through the funding support of Land Rover uh, New Zealand and Himalayan Trust New Zealand and our uh, Sulawak aid. Uh, and then uh, a couple of other um, uh, organizations supported uh, for this joint project and the Kumbu Pasangam Rural Municipality, Saraban National Park and Buffer Zone. They, it's a kind of joint collaboration and, uh, uh, you know, a couple of multiple donors uh, uh, join hands to implement this project. And this has been, this project has been uh, successful and completed. I think I came to the end of the slide, and uh, I might have taken more time. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, for your time, and uh, I'm sure you have lots of questions, and I'll be happy to answer after whenever uh, chairperson permits. Thank you very much. Well, thank Your you Honor. very much, Bingo. That was much appreciated. Um, we'll have a, an opportunity at the end of our hour um, for general business and questions. Um, so just for the time being, we'll, we'll keep the process going. We're gonna move on to our two sort of key areas of operation, education and health. And I'd like to introduce Mike Gill, who will speak to you about this. Uh, 
Have we got the first slide there? Um, oh, no. well, namaste, namaste, everybody. And um, uh, and I will try to summarize an education program in five minutes. And I, when I sat down to do this, I came up with four words beginning with L. And and here they are. They are lockdown. We all know about lockdowns. And just trying to summarize education under the next two headings, literacy and livelihood. Um, and the fourth one is localization. Now, I just want to say at this point, concerning the education program, we acknowledge the enormous help and value of the funding we get from MFAT, who fund 60% of our education program, leaving um, the Himalayan Trust for 40%. And we have a great relationship with MFAT. It's been a, a pleasure to be um, involved with them. So, now, sorry, Mike, would you be able to turn your video on? Ooh, oh yes. <laughs> Thank you. That's, um, I'm glad I turned the microphone on. And um, well, the, 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 just a few words about lockdown. The main foreign currency earning for Nepal is migrant workers in the Middle East and Southeast Asia. And when the lockdown came along, it locked down the Middle East and Southeast Asia. And Nepalis returned to their villages. And here is the typical Nepali village. Um, there's the mother of the family working on her small plot, which is not much more than subsistence living. And these migrant workers have just sort of joined the family um, and intensified the farming effort. Um, we don't know how much hardship there is out there, but Nepalis are a resistant lot. But we do know that they have lost the best part of a year of education. Now, literacy, now we've had, have had a, for four years now, we have had, no, had an MFAT funded program expanding literacy improvement in nine Kumbu schools. But in the current program, we're extending that to 45 schools down in the Solu region. Um, it will differ from the Kumbu program in that we, there's a lot of English spoken, there's English is in the air and this, where all the trekkers are up in Kumbu, but down in Solu, it is Nepali literacy which has to come first. How does it work? Well, it's just about the each day starts with a literacy period where they people talk, they read, they listen, they write, um, and it's been it's it's been a successful program. It just seems to loosen up the rest of the education program. Well, just to have a quick look at what solar looks like, here we are going into the village of Bung, which is a, a typical example, a large village um, with many smaller villages nearby and where the schools we are working. And a typical parent and pupil group there at Pelmung School, which is the next one on from Bung. It, it's a different country, so they're the people are wry, they are not Sherpas, um, but here they are, the people who we are now working with. Just another shot just to show the countryside, and that is, if we could see out to the left, we would see the large villages of Sotang and Bung. This one is Cheskam. In one way, it looks relatively benign in this photo, but in the cloud behind us, some quite big mountains. And down below, separate separating the village of Gudel, where we are, from Bung on the other side, is a gorge, and that's what the gorge looks like. So it is not an easy country to move around in, and I, I, can't, I, I just will quote one of the great poems ever written in the Himalayas, it was written by Bill Tillman, who had just crossed from Bung to Gudel via this gorge, and, he, and he, his poem went, he said, there's a horror that nothing can quell when looking from Bung Kudu to Gudel, and words die away on the tongue at the prospect of Gudel from Bung. <laughs> well, um,
Li um, now, I did livelihoods. After all, education is about preparing kids and children for livelihoods. Um, and so the second part of the program, the first is literacy is in grades one to three, the next is in grades three to 10, teaching the key subject, math, science, social studies, this local curriculum which we're helping with. Um, and um, for this teaching, and the reason I've got this, ooh, let me have a look. No. The reason I've got a, a woman teacher illustrated here is that the Himalayan Trust Nepal has just employed four new teachers and they're correcting the gender balance. And we now have some women teachers who are clearly the future of education um, in the hills of Nepal. And the other key bit of our program is scholarships as people go into tertiary education in Kathmandu. And the final item I bring up is localization. Um, Now, there is a major trend in development in NGOs to devolve management out of the donor country and into the recipient country. And to some extent, I would have to say we are making a virtue out of necessity here. Um, but for us, it has meant handing more management to the Himalayan Trust Nepal wherever possible. And it seems to make a lot of sense and that they are the people who live there in Nepal. It's their language, their culture and they can visit solo kumba school, schools at will, and they can speak the language of the teachers. And I might say that Ed always localised thing, but we can now claim that we are catching up with Ed. Well, what happens next? Nepal schools have reopened after the Desai holiday, which is a one month collection of holidays, and the Himalayan Trust Nepal staff are going into Junbezi and into the solo area of Sotang and Bung. So this time next year, there will be a lot of new work to report on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Well, now we move on to hear a bit about health um, up there in Solo Kumbu, and I'd like to invite Lindsay Strang to address us, please. Yeah, good evening. Namaste, uh, Seshi Delhi. I'm going to briefly cover the health from the Himalayan Trust point of view, and some of it you've already heard from from Mingma Norby. And if uh, we could have the first slide, Alexander, is nothing showing on yeah. the. Yeah, great. So here we are in the Solar Kumbu, in the Kumbu area, and looking at, at Mount Everest way in the distance there. Next slide. I call this Kundi from, from smallpox to COVID. And it was the smallpox epidemic in 1963 that gave Sir Ed the impetus to look into the health needs of the community. And it didn't take long to find that not only was a smallpox and the epidemic was going through, but there's also goiter, tuberculosis, and a host of other illnesses that a hospital could, could serve and to help people deal with these problems. Next slide. And so here, here is Quinty Hospital, and I can point to it here for those who can't see me pointing. Uh, it's Quinty Hospital sitting well above in the upper reaches of Quinty Village. And I'd also mention the just from where this photograph is taken, the the, the um, small memorial stones that commemorate the tragedy of the loss of life of Louise and Belinda Hillary. And this was the start of the building of Papu Hospital in 1975. Next slide. And you've seen this photograph too, but uh, second from the second from the right is Kami Chamba, Dr. Kami Chamba at the back, and below him, uh, Dr. Uh, Kanchi uh, from from uh, also she grew up locally, was trained in the Philippines, and she is taking over the work now of Kami Chamba at 
Community Hospital. And we see some of the health assistants in the front row, and also Dr. Mingman Norbu and Fasang Dawa from the Himalayan Trust. And I have to say they are extremely active in, in keeping up the contact with the local schools, the schools in Solda Kumbu, and the both Hapu and Kundi hospitals. There are three outreach clinics with village health assistance. Uh, over 5,700 patient contacts for the year. Uh, the strong COVID message via social media and face to face. And on the left, we see in the area behind Kundi Hospital, Kami Temba instructing local people about the epidemiology of COVID-19 and on the right, the uh, uh, PPE, the personal uh, protection equipment that was handed over to other to the health clinics and to other organizations in the Solid Kumbu. Next. And this was a handover equipment to the Namchi Dental Clinic. The Namchi Dental Clinic uh, had gone into, into uh, limbo for a while and they required um, funding and to do repair work. And I have to say that the funding came from in the Bidding Sabbath Way in Christchurch and they were able to uh, finance a, a new autoclave and a factory operated uh, endomotor which enabled the clinic to get underway again. The Napshi, next slide. The Napshi Dental Clinic uh, it goes out and, and does these camps uh, for, the, for the local schools as we see on the left and also for the uh, particularly with dental instruction and also on the right at the local Tamo monastery and not only in dedication but they would do dental checks and then if people needed dental care refer them on down to uh, their base in in Namchi. The uh, clinic is also organized. Uh, they do uh, denture fitting, uh, compound uh, extraction, uh, extractions of impacted teeth and root canals and friction and denture fitting as I mentioned. So very capable of what they can do and with the funding support they're enabled to continue. So I mentioned Parfum Hospital and out of the tragedy that was involved with those deaths from the beginning of the building of Parfum Hospital, uh, has, has come a very strong base now financed by a, a German trust and they provide, uh, this has been funded for many years from Germany and it's through Himalayan Trust the Power and they act as a conduit for uh, the support and enable a high quality mental ser services to be Sustained. COVID 19 has been monitored and treated by staff at Parfu Hospital, protected by, by PPE that was over $25,000 was financed with Himalayan Trust and American Himalayan Foundation. There's a memorandum of understanding between Parfu and Parfu Hospital and Himalayan Trust Nepal. And this ensures efficient staff and medical services plus maintenance of the facilities. There are five health posts affiliated with Parfum Hospital. I'll say a little bit more about health posts in the Solid area. And there's the uh, Forgotten Shippers to the Pal Trust, which is actually based on in Geraldine. And Yes, Geraldine, South Canterbury, and this was a group that was is chaired by George Hunter, and they are people who have been tramping through the Geraldine Tramping Club into the area 
just north of Oklahoma in Solu. They have built a, a, a clinic or had built through their funding a clinic with which sees nearly a thousand patients per year at Goli, and they is staffed by fully trained health workers. And their fundraising they do mainly through an opportunity shop in Toluca. So if you were passing through Toluca, you can see the Sherpa shop. I'd just like to finish by saying. that the, it's so encouraging to see the continuity of the uh, uh, the model of healthcare through the Himalayan Trust. With the training of local people and the succession to the role of health management and its deliveries. And I think it's in a strong position and with Himalayan Trust support to continue in a sustainable fashion. Thank you. Gee, I wish we could all be there in Christchurch to enjoy the hospitality and conviviality that, that everyone's enjoying there, but maybe next year. All right, well, next we come to Himalayan Trust Finance, and I'd like to invite Jason Edwards, our accountant, uh, to address us, please. Hi, everyone. Many thanks. And uh, lovely to see everyone again, albeit virtually. Um, much like previous years, um, I just wanted to quickly summarize the finances, which people will also see in page 10 of the annual review that was circulated. Um, and there have been um, obviously fully audited financial statements. In fact, the auditors have finalize those and sign off on those this week, um, and we'll shortly um, file those with charity services. In terms of highlights for the year, obviously um, continuity and security of funding is of crucial importance, and obviously can't thank enough um, MFAT for their support. We have a grant agreement with MFAT, which is for five and a half years to July 2025. And that is worth one point or just over $1.9 million. And obviously having that security um, is, is crucial, particularly in the challenging environment that the last year or the last two years has been. Um, obviously, COVID-19 has had a huge impact on the staff of Himalayan Trust New Zealand, um, an impact on fundraising, um, and obviously more of that to come in the future. Um, and obviously with our partner, as we heard from Mingma um, in Nepal, in terms of the um, rollout of the various projects. Um, despite the challenges though, certainly the board is committed to ambitious projects, um, meaning the obligations to the likes of MFAT, um, whilst always looking for improving effectiveness of the spend and the accountability. Um, and as Peter mentioned earlier on, obviously one of the big focuses of New Zealand in particular for the past year and going forward is raising funds. Um, and just finishing off on that slide, the um, as I say, the audit of the financial statements has been completed this week. Um, they do also, as well as looking at um, boring number stuff, they also look at the outputs of the Himalayan Trust um, and make sure those are supported. Um, and that covers areas such as literacy improvement, um, teacher training, scholarships, school infrastructure, community engagement, etc. So the auditors look at that as well. As a summary of um, where the money comes from, if you like, this is a similar chart that we've had in previous years, um, even more dis disaggregated this year, and so really quite quite good information. So the total income for the year ended 30 June was $1.4 million. Uh, as you can see there, 16% came from government grant by way of MFAT. 
donations and bequests, 13%. That includes regular giving um, for an increasing pool of donors who obviously, as the word entails, um, give the same amount each and every month. Uh, the various appeals and fundraising through the year are important. Um, those, for example, were for COVID and um, Christmas appeal. One of the new items this year, which will be talked about a bit later on in the AGM, uh, was events that were undertaken. And you can see events income there for the first time really is quite significant, 13%. Historically, the trust has had sort of one-off events in terms of some of you were would remember and lucky enough to be at the centenary dinner in Auckland in July 19, was it? Um, the this year, um, number of initiatives have um, taken place, including Everest Day, um, which will be on a go forward basis. Um, and that sort of couples nicely with one of the other major items there you see a summit challenge for 7%. Obviously, summit challenge, um, fundraising through walking, climbing, biking, whatever you want to do. Um, for the height of Everest, um, was affected a little bit by lockdown, but still going from strength to strength. And some of you probably know about the descent challenge, which has also um, been implemented this year. So there was income of $1.4 million. And pleasingly, the expenditure for the year was $947,000. Obviously, the focus of that is the uh, quality education program. That accounts for 43% of it. Um, and obviously, that covers all the things that Mike, um, Mike Gill talked about um, just immediately prior to myself. Um, the other ones, obviously, the health response, which Lindsay talked about, PPE and support there. Also, Kunde Hospital, 6%. Um, as well as various healthcare and water projects and villages. We do also ensure the um, effectiveness and accountability for the spend, I guess, through having both um, in Nepal and in New Zealand specific um, personnel you know, monitoring and managing the programs. Um, and on a local basis, obviously, the employee and administration costs makes up most of the rest. In terms of the financial position of the trust, this is effectively the assets, that's the liabilities of the trust. So the net assets of the trust is $4.7 million. Um, and that was about $4.2 million in the prior year. The majority of that is made up of investments. Um, and investments continue to be um, in a moderately conservative portfolio. It's fair to say, and you probably noticed it in your own Kiwi Savers and investments, it was a fairly good year um, in the market. Um, the trust has a range of bonds and equities, et cetera, um, and got a return of 13% um, percent for the year. Um, which, given interest rates these days, um, which are not that high, um, and inflation, et cetera, is um, you know, an, obviously an extremely um, pleasing result. Uh, MFAT arrangements, I've talked a bit about that. Um, obviously, it's $1.9 million for the entire five and a half years. We have, um, in June, we did receive the second installment of $385,000, which covers the 12 months from the 1st of November. Um, and I thought I'd just also mention that there are still tagged funds in relation to the Avalanche um, Fund, which is in some ways you sort of lose track of that because of everything that happened in terms of earthquake and then COVID and what have you. But the trust continues to support um, the children of the Sherpas that um, <clears throat> passed away in the avalanche. Um, and there's still tagged funds of around $45,000 held for that purpose. 
finishing off just with the financial performance then, you would have understood, looking at those charts I talked about, where income was 1.4 million and expenditure of 0.95, um, basic mass tells you that that means we made a profit or a surplus of half a million dollars. Um, in reality, some of that obviously was a little bit because of the deferral of projects in Nepal. Um, but you know, really, a great credit to the to the board and the team, all the staff in terms of particularly um, the events income with Everest, etc., which was one hundred eighty-two thousand dollars. Um, getting the donations and bequests heading up towards $200,000. Obviously, the ongoing and essential support of IMFAT, for which we're very grateful. And the investment performance really helped the result this year, i.e. the return was you know, over half a million dollars on the investment. Um, and certainly the plan with the investment fund is to you know, effectively form an endowment fund for the long-term sustainability of the trust. And in that regard, their statements of investment policies and objectives uh, have been developed. Um, and the expenditure there on the right-hand side, um, as we talked about, quality education, um, you know, 400K plus in quality education, that's the bulk of it, but also those other projects, healthcare, water, COVID-19, um, Kundi Hospital, et cetera. Uh, so that was a fairly quick run through of the finances. Um, as I say, pleasing result, net assets up in terms of $4.7 million um, as of today, and a good surplus, which the trust can continue to build on. Uh, thank you, back to you, um, Peter. Thanks very much, Jason, much appreciated. I'd now like to introduce you to our Himalayan Trust staff and to the fundraising work that, that they are doing. We have four staff on the Himalayan Trust now. We have Tim Kay, who is the fundraising manager. We have Alexander Hillary, who's the New Zealand operations manager. And just recently, we have Casey Hemingway, who is our marketing manager. Claire Linthwaite, is our support care coordinator. So I'd like to ask Tim Kay to talk us through a bit about the fundraising we've been doing and our objectives for the future. Thank you, Tim. Yes, thank you, Peter. Namaste, everyone. First, yeah, I'd like to present the Trust's fundraising achievements over the last financial year. <clears throat> and then I'd like to briefly mention the Himalayan Trust Endowment Fund. We live in a constantly shifting environment that presents both challenges and opportunities. The global pandemic has changed the landscape in which the Himalayan Trust works. We cannot go back to the way things were. We will not survive by maintaining the status quo. We must do things differently. We need to have the courage to implement new and innovative <coughs> ideas. This past year, we have risen to that challenge. Our fundraising strategy we implemented reflected a dynamic and diversified fundraising plan, where we thought more expansively and embraced new and innovative fundraising activities. With all the challenges that COVID-19 threw at us, we've had a very successful fundraising year. Total fundraising income achieved for the 2021 year was 649,000. I've actually rounded these figures out. Against a fundraising target of 387,000, an increase of 262,000 or 68%. This can be broken down as follows. Regular giving and general donations, which I've grouped together, totaled 147,000 against a target of 125,000. Our electronic direct marketing appeals totaled 70,000 against a target of 62,000. Trust events, 
which included the, the launch of Everest Day, which is our inaugural national fundraising appeal this uh, last year, last year, totaled 182,000 against a target, a conservative target of 35,000. Corporate engagement totaled 70,000 against a target of 50,000. The summit challenge, which Alex will talk about further, raised 94,000 against a target of 34,000. General peer-to-peer -peer fundraising raised 25,000 against a target of 6,000. The only income category that did not achieve target was major donors, which raised 48,000 against a target of 64,000. Fundraising expenditure for the year totaled 61,000 against a target of 84,000, a decrease of 22,000 or 38%. Net profit from fundraising was 588,000 against a target of 302,000, an increase of 285,000 or 94%. In summary, it cost the trust 9.5 cents to raise $1. Within the charity sector, the accepted fundraising cost is between 20 and 25 cents to raise a dollar. So I think uh, we've done extremely well, as you can see, over the last 12 months. I'd now like to highlight a couple of key fundraising events that we implemented during the year. Firstly, our Christmas appeal. Back in May, June last year, we launched our COVID-19 emergency response fundraising appeal to raise funds for the purchase of PPE equipment and medical supplies for hospitals and medical clinics across the Solokumbu. The appeal was well supported by our community, raising $40,000 from 280 donors at an average donation of $140 per donor. Later in the year, Nepal experienced a major COVID-19 outbreak. So the trust decided that the Christmas appeal would focus on supporting the frontline health workers as well as providing humanitarian support to the communities of the Everest region. The Christmas Appeal raised over $30,000 from 251 donors at an average donation of $119 per donor. Messaging was key to the success of this appeal. We communicated the difference donations would make, however small, and that donors would be helping to save lives. We also showed photos of supplies arriving and being distributed, and we set up a donation tier system where we provided a simple explanation of the impact that various sizes of gifts can make towards our goal. The strategy behind this appeal was to motivate people to give by being emotionally connected with the people, their donation benefits. The appeal also resulted and 12 of our monthly regular givers agreeing to increase their giving level by $565 per month, or just under $7,000 per year. Secondly, on, this, on Saturday the 29th of May, which is the anniversary of the ascent of Mount Everest, we launched our inaugural flagship national fundraising and awareness appeal called Everest Day. This appeal provided us with the opportunity of celebrating this memorable achievement, as well as honouring the lasting legacy of Sir Ed and the impact he made to the people of the Everest region. This inaugural event was a huge success, both financially, as well as promoting the work of the Trust to the New Zealand community. 179,000 was raised against an income target of 60,000. And the event costs, including staff time, was 18,000, which worked out at 10% of income achieved, which is a very low percentage when organising a campaign of this magnitude. The social media results from Everest Day were very encouraging. Facebook saw a page reach of 326,200 people, and Instagram saw a reach of 34,000 
886 people. We also acquired approximately 1,500 new donors to the trust. So you can see how successful this Everest Day was to the trust. Everest Day involved three main fundraising vehicles. Firstly, the Fiverr for Ed appeal, where the New Zealand public were invited to donate $5 through fiverrfored.nz. The appeal was promoted through using a range of social media platforms which was spearheaded by our Himalayan Trust ambassadors, high profile New Zealand business people, sports people and celebrities. The Fiverr for Ed appeal raised over $70,000 from 1,547 donors at an average donation of $45 per donor. Secondly, we launched the COVID-19 electronic direct marketing appeal, which targeted our donor database raising $55,000 from 189 donors at an average donation of $291 per, per, per donor, an extraordinary result. Thirdly, we work closely with our supporters, where a range of fundraising activities were held nationwide involving schools, New Zealand businesses, the New Zealand Party Association, the University of Waikato Hillary Scholars and Alumni, Hermitage Mount Cook, to name just a few. We also launched Everest Day with fundraising events held at the Edmund Hillary Retirement Village in Auckland and Argy Bargy Restaurant in Christchurch. Funds raised from these activities totaled over $45,000. Plans are well underway for Everest Day 2022, and in 2023, Everest Day will focus very much on the 70th anniversary of the first ascent of Mount Everest. Finally, I'd just like to briefly mention the Homeland Trust Endowment Fund, which will secure the future financial viability and sustainability of the trust. One thing is for certain, when you work in the charity sector, the competition for the charity dollar will only get more intense. Donors are becoming inundated with requests and are finding it increasingly difficult to respond to all the worthy causes. The Himalayan Trust has developed an integrated, I'm just trying to, here we go. The Himalayan Trust has developed an integrated and diversified annual fundraising plan that will provide regular funding streams to support our programs in Nepal. Moving forward, our major focus must also be to develop a culture of giving or a culture of philanthropy in the long term financial sustainability of the Himalayan Trust is one of the key challenges we face today. Now and into the future, we must secure major donor gifts in order to establish a $10 million endowment fund for the Trust. This would allow the Trust to meet the challenges of the future as successfully as it has met those of the past. Major donors are very important to the Trust because their future gifts will make up a large part of our overall fundraising revenue. So Ed's aspirations and vision have shaped our history as New Zealanders, and they have impacted positively on the Everest region. Today, we must aspire to shape the future of the Himalayan Trust and the contribution it continues to make in Nepal. By making an endowment gift, donors are creating an enduring and visible imprint on the future of the trust and the lives of the communities which Sir Ed supported and which in turn supported him. For further information on the Himalayan Trust Endowment Fund, please go to the himalayantrust.org forward slash request and endowment as is on my screen. That completes my fundraising report, Peter. Um, back to you or over to Alex to continue talking about our fundraising moving forward. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Hi, um, Hi. my name's uh, Alexander Hillary. Uh, I'm the son of Peter Hillary. Um, so I've been working with the Trust since February this year uh, when I was brought on to assist with Summit Challenge 2021. Uh, so since that time, uh, I've been assisting with communications, general fundraising and organisation. 
Um, early on in my time uh, with the Himalayan Trust, uh, I realized there was an important need for a calendar of events. Uh, so we needed to have fundraisers events throughout the year uh, that maintained our presence and, and covered a broad demographic and spiked interest in donations. And that's what Tim and I have been working on closely. And I think we've achieved really well through this calendar year um, with obviously Summit Challenge starting in March, Everest Day and the uh, the fundraising component of Everest Day, which is a five of red in May, uh, Descent Challenge in August and sort of bookending these is the Christmas Appeal. Um, and we hope these will be very regular events um, for the Himalayan Trust. So Summit Challenge, as Tim has outlined, was a great success this year. We were able to reduce the overall expenditure for the campaign and focus uh, on using digital marketing techniques to gain our participants, our support and our, our donations. Um, and this was the first time that the Himalayan Trust has used data-driven marketing in this way. Um, and we think it resulted in a really cost-effective um, way of advertising and um, I guess gathering a really enthusiastic community of participants and supporters. So we had uh, 225 participants that were able to raise donations from over a thousand donors and um, some also attended. We had actually 10 events um, in Christchurch, Auckland and Wellington. Um, and this was something that we're really hoping to pursue more and do more of. Um, in-person events uh, surrounding trust activities. And this year, um, I must say, these, these events were really made possible by the incredible support of the International Antarctic Centre, um, whose dedication to the, the Summit Challenge fundraiser and the Himalayan Trust in general um, has just been an enormous help. So thank you to, to Todd and Miranda and Berenji, who I believe are in, in Christchurch uh, with the group there. But yeah, the challenge proved itself to be quite an effective way to raise um, donations, but also raise awareness for the trust itself in, in new and young demographics. And that's something um, that is a big focus for me. Um, so similarly with Summit Challenge, we use these digital marketing techniques uh, for Everest Day, um, paired with the incredible support from a lot of notable New Zealanders um, to make the Everest Day campaign a success. Um, this campaign differed from the Summit Challenge in the way that um, the campaign focused on New Zealand as a whole, uh, with little focus on specific demographics. So this campaign really provided the ideal opportunity for the Trust to tell the story of Sered and how a bond between New Zealand and Nepal has formed, uh, and also why that, that is significant. Um, the story is essential for the trust's image and messaging, and it's um, therefore vital we, we keep that legacy alive. And I guess, as Tim has outlined, um, Everest Day is our vehicle uh, for doing so in the general population of New Zealand. So Fiverr for Ed, as part of that um, Everest Day campaign, um, really saw its strength through the utilisation of just the iconic imagery um, surrounding the ascent of Everest, um, as well as the familiarity of New Zealand's $5 note with Ed's portrait. And as a result of that, we saw the largest amount of first time Himalayan Trust donors through this campaign. Um, so that'll be a big focus for uh, a fiber thread moving forwards is getting uh, new Kiwi donors. So most recently, um, the Descent, Descent Challenge had its inaugural month in uh, August of this year. So the challenge is modelled off Descent Challenge, um, but has a different set of goals and is, is completed by skiing or downhill biking. And it's it's quite a new audience uh, for the Himalayan Trust, um, but it, I guess the challenge draws parallels uh, between New Zealand and Nepal for a common love of the mountains. Uh, the challenge showed really promising results this year. Um, and we were really happy with how it established and grew uh, some great ambassadorial and corporate partnerships um, that we think will be really valuable for the trust. Uh, in particular, the relationship with uh, Kadrona ski fields uh, down in the South Island, um, which the International Antarctic Centre really helped facilitate that. Um, but the key to growing these campaigns uh, really is with uh, increasing engagement. Pardon me. Um, the key, I guess the key to, to making these successful is through our marketing. Um, and so I guess next up, I'd like to ask our new marketing manager, um, Casey Hemingway, just to talk a little bit about that strategy. But before I pass over to him, um, 
we have a new Christmas Appeal campaign coming up. We'll be starting that in um, just over a week. And the Christmas Appeal this year is uh, inspired by an old story um, from the Himalayan Trust, from the building of Kundi Hospital, um, of a wonderful story of Max Pearl, uh, dressed as Santa, uh, astride a yak. And this photo was taken um, while Ed and his family were over in Nepal um, building that hospital. And so that is, I guess, a core part um, of our Christmas campaign because we think it's a really wonderful, exciting story. So this for this campaign, we're running a uh, donation appeal, but we also um, have created a number of Christmas cards um, to which represent donations uh, to our projects in Nepal. So we encourage you uh, to go to the new website and have a look. Um, you never know if you're looking for a gift this year, it could be the one. Um, but yeah, thank you very much and I'll pass on to Casey. Good evening, everyone. As Alex just introduced, my name is Casey Hemingway. Uh, I've been working with the Trust since uh, Summit Challenge earlier this year, but have just in the last month or two come onto the team full time to help um, primarily focus on broadening the Trust's supporter base. Uh, as members, I'm sure you will know that uh, for the longest time, we've sort of relied on um, sort of a particular demographic, and we're now looking to create a stronghold of supporters, particularly with um, young New Zealanders, uh, thinking about how we can instill uh, our mission. And as Alex has just mentioned, the um, parallels between New Zealand and Nepal and that beautiful relationship that we have. So we're thinking about how we can reach this younger audience and um, digital marketing and specifically the use of tools through social media are uh, really powerful because that's where a lot of this younger demographic, myself being part of that, uh, where we reside online. And um, so we're looking at, you know, leveraging those tools to reach the audience, to, you know, provoke them to engage with some of our various fundraising events. And that's been, you know, part of the in impetus to create these more um, sort of inclusive events that aren't purely focused on donation, but, you know, you can come and have a bit of fun skiing a few laps at Cadrona, trying to see how many how many vertical meters you can get in in a day. So we're really looking to in, encourage participation and then of these participants to share their experiences. Um, and uh, obviously, as a part of this is we, we want to have sort of a, a modern and highly efficient functional web platform. So we've just finished building the new Himalayan Trust website and uh, we'd love you all to go and have a look at it and well, send through your feedback if you've got any. Um, that's not much more to say from me, uh, so I'll pass back on to Peter. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Casey. Thank you, Alexander, and thank you, Tim, for going over uh, what they're trying to accomplish and, and are doing uh, for the Himalayan Trust. Now, I just need to check with Alexander, has our patron arrived? Oh, there she is. Oh, wonderful. Well, look, it's my absolute privilege to introduce our patron, Helen Clark, to address our annual general meeting for, for the Himalayan Trust. Welcome, Helen. Thanks so much, Peter. And I've, I've been listening since about uh, half past six, so it's been great to to hear all the reports and truly congratulations on what's uh, happening at the Trust, the, the innovative fundraising and, and events. And uh, as I think Alexander just said, um, engaging a new generation of Kiwis in the style of activities that you're undertaking. And, and that's so important because, uh, you know, some of us grew up with the legend of Ed, but for others, it's the history book. So keeping that alive is just, just so so critical and I really congratulate you on what you're achieving. Also, Tim Kay uh, really enjoyed the fundraising report there. Look, look, of course, it, it, it's hard going, you know, as Tim said, every donor uh, is is being pressed from all sides. But, you know, the trust has a great story and a great record. And of course, uh, you know, Ed's legacy. So let's hope we can keep enthusing uh, people to give for that. Uh, I missed uh, Mingma's uh, presentation, but I have tried to keep a little bit abreast of what's been happening in the solid kombu uh, through the pandemic. 
It disturbed me a bit, frankly, that the most news we got about uh, COVID in the region was how it was affecting climbers at base camp rather than how it was affecting uh, the the local people in the in the communities. And of course, you know, there were deaths, there was serious illness, and and there will be long COVID uh, as well. But again, it was very encouraging to see the trust pivot from an early stage uh, to support the health response. Uh, And, you know, every little bit counts when you're trying to get PPE and and just basic supplies for the uh, health system. Uh, Earlier on, I think it was uh, perhaps uh, Michael who or the presentation on health mentioned that best practice and development is to do as much as you can uh, through the local delivery. And so, of course, a lot more is being done uh, uh, hands on in Nepal itself, which is all positive. Uh, But that, you know, that was Ed's way too to very much um, take one's lead from the local people and the the needs that they are uh, specifying that are that are most uh, important. So I feel really quite excited by what I've heard uh, over the last uh, 40, 45 minutes or so about what's happening. Of course, I'd I'd love to get back up to the solid kumbu, as I guess everybody uh, would. We we are are really getting cabin fever in New Zealand now, we can say to our Nepalese friends. Uh, And uh, Peter, I'm not sure when you last had an expedition there, but you must be itching to get those boots on the the solid kumbu uh, again. Uh, But uh, certainly at the you know, the first opportunity when we're through this, I'd, I'd, I'd love to be coming back again to um, to, to support the work. So uh, congratulations to uh, everyone. And thanks thanks to all who've helped and, and donated. Uh, I think it's uh, really been uh, quite remarkable to get the response that's been got uh, over the past year. So thanks, Peter, and over and out from me. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, it's uh, a, just a wonderful honour for us to have you as as the patron of the Himalayan Trust, and I appreciate you taking the time to join the meeting tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, now it's up to general business and the opportunity for some questions. So we'll now open the meeting uh, to general business and questions. If you want to um, put your virtual hand up, and and it's up there near the, the top bar, um, in, in this team's presentation, you, you can put a little hand shape up and Alexander and Casey will be able to give you the mic uh, and um, show your image uh, so that you can raise raise a point or, or ask a question. So feel free to um, raise your hand. Well, I should, probably should have come up with a one I was going to put put in myself. <laughs> Otherwise, um, you should be able to just turn off your microphone or turn on your microphone, rather, and um, yeah. Okay. Well, look, maybe I'll just um, pr- go to some of my clo- closing comments. Um, and if oh, um, Peter? oh, yes. Oh, sorry. Yes. Got a bit of delayed response. I've got a question here from Christchurch. Is this a microphone? Hello. Oh, no. Over here. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, my question regarding the financial report. Gunter Hammer is my name. Uh, um, you talked about the uh, financial investment that the Himalayan Trust has, $4.4 million. Could you tell us a little more about where that money is invested? and whether there's any uh, ethical consideration being given to that investment. G'day, Jason here. Um, sorry, could you just repeat the very last part of the question? Uh, the question was regarding the financial investment that the Himalayan Trust is running and uh, whether there's any ethical considerations being given to those, those investments. Thank you. So the Thank investment so is the with, investment is with, I'm getting some feedback here, but I'll, um, sorry, yeah, could you please sorry. turn off the microphone and just while. Yeah, we'll try that, eh? 
So the investment is with um, PWA, Private Wealth Advisors, who have been the investment advisors for well, 10 plus years, I think, ever since basically the um, funds transferred from the BNZ, which was on, largely on term deposits to try to get a better return in a portfolio. Um, so PWA, who are based in Auckland and are independent advisors, manage it with oversight from the Finance Committee of the Himalayan Trust. Um, it is a moderately conservative portfolio is what they call it. So there's a mix of cash and term deposits, international equities, Australasian equities and property funds. Um, and on average, about quarterly, the Finance Committee reviews the position. Um, as I mentioned in my report, there is a statement of investment policies and objectives that has been developed in the last six months and is in the process of being implemented. Um, and one of the other Finance Committee may want to confirm, but um, it certainly provides criteria for risk profile of investment, and I believe also the um, nature of the investment, including ethical considerations. Thank you, Jason. Yes, and look, I'd like to add to that, um, and I can assure you that areas such as, um, you know, I mean, whether it's cigarettes or uranium mining, all of these sorts of areas uh, ethical considerations, and we we do not invest in them. Um, Are there any any more questions? Peter, there has been a a, a message question um, from Rosemary. Uh, so the move to get, she said, the move to get computers up into schools is fantastic and a great initiative. Um, she knows that is an early stage, but one thing she's asking is that there may be an issue going forward with the disposal of e-waste. Um, so I wonder, Mingma, if you're able to help, is there a scope to cover the costs of e-waste within this initiative? Um, so I guess with disposing of and recycling the computers after they've been used. much for the uh, question related to education and environment and uh, actually we so far we didn't face that kind of challenges or problems we we repair and uh, use the computers and one of the computers that i have been using is like 15 years old and it's still working so uh, <laughs> we didn't face that kind of challenge but if that happens uh, we have this you know the um, the, we have the Indian recycling uh, 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 plans, and then the, there are some Indian people who buy the, the old scrap materials and they take to the factory or industry and then they recycle all the metals or plastics or whatever. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mingma. Any other questions? Well, look, while people are thinking about that, I'd just like to go on to some closing remarks where I've also got a few other final announcements for our annual general meeting this evening. And I just want to say thank you to everyone for attending this virtual annual general meeting. Next year in 2022, we hope to have an in-person AGM again. They really are a lot of fun to, to be able to be with people and share time with each other. In many ways, that's what being part of an organization like the Himalayan Trust is all about. And we're all a bit envious of the people in Christchurch who are able to be together tonight. This is an important part of the Himalayan Trust community. Looking even further ahead, and I've been putting quite a bit of work into this for 2023, we have some pretty lofty plans. As Tim Kay mentioned, this will be the 70th anniversary of the first ascent of Mount Everest by my father in Tenzing, Norgay, 
on the British expedition. And we've got some wonderful things that are going to happen, and we hope you can join us. We're going to open the Sir Edmund Hillary Visitor Centre uh, at Kundrum School on the 29th of May, 2023. This is the original school building, and we are going to set it up as a small museum, a visitor centre, interpretation of education in Kumbu and of the environment and the protection of the environment. <laughs> so we'll also be having treks uh, going up into Kumbu that will coincide with this event. And I hope by 2023, we can have many of you join us uh, for some of those events up there. Down in Kathmandu, I'm collaborating with um, Sir Graham Wrigley of the Himalayan Trust UK, and we hope to have a special 70th anniversary at the British Museum in Kathmandu, and after that, an event in Delhi at both the New Zealand High Commission and the British High Commission. And then towards the end of June, we're hoping to have a major dinner uh, here in New Zealand to celebrate the 70th anniversary of that first ascent of Mount Everest. So there's a lot happening over the next couple of years, and we do want you all to be involved. We will have many opportunities for Himalayan Trust members and supporters to engage with the Himalayan Trust, attend events, meet visitors from Nepal when they come to New Zealand, and enjoy each other's company too. That's a very important part of it. Thank you again for attending today's virtual event, and thank you for your support of the Himalayan Trust. Good night. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good night.